The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting-edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Talohungva. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. It's a first for North Carolina. The governor is tapping a native woman for a cabinet position. Roy Cooper's pick to head the state's Department of Administration is Pamela Brewington Cashwell. She's Lumbee and Cohare. This position is in charge of overseeing the operation of the state's government. According to census data, there are more than 168,000 Native Americans living in the state. Casual currently works at the Department of Public Safety. She's held positions with the State Ethics Commission and the U.S. Department of Justice, including its Civil Rights Division. Though Casual still has to be confirmed by the Senate, she's able to start her new job. After the Mississippi Band of Choctaw lost 33 people to the coronavirus, tribal citizens came together to feed and protect one another. The band has more than 11,000 citizens, and they have lost 113 due to this pandemic. Brian Mask lives on the Pearl Re River Reservation. He, along with other tribal citizens, began to collect food and hygiene products for a one-day drive. With so many donations, they turned a former dollar store into temporary headquarters, naming it Honoring the Choctaw Spirit. Donation requests are posted on social media and also by word of mouth. They say their drive unified the tribe by reacquainting old friends and building relationships. A beer sales project to raise funds for organizations that support Indigenous women is creating some controversy. Great Lakes Brewery in Toronto, Canada, helped to launch the event called Celebrating Sisters Indigenous Brew Day. Coordinators of the event are accused of smudging the beer. Organizers say they were only smudging people as the project launched. Troy Birch, marketing manager for the brewery, says in hindsight, he realizes that posting photos of the smudging was insensitive. It's a learning opportunity for the company, he says. The brewery plans to continue working with indigenous communities. This is the second year of the event. The first one was held last year on National Indigenous Peoples Day. As college basketball finals wind, wind down, it's time for high school athletes to gear up for the chance to earn a basketball scholarship. Recently, Tribal Nations Recruiting held the West Coast Desert Showcase in Phoenix, Arizona. 113 players came to the campus of the American Indian College, all with the hopes of grabbing the attention of the coaches. Um, I am Jalen Yarrow. I'm from Jessica, Nevada, and I am from Premier Lake Tribe from Nixon, Nevada. My name is Naomi Baird, I'm from Winnebago, Nebraska, and I'm part of the Winnebago Tribe. I play um, point guard and shooting guard. Hello, my name is Layla Seabury. Um, I'm Northern Arapaho. I'm from Pitti, Wyoming, and I'm a sophomore. We're bringing them out here from all over Indian country to come showcase in front of NCAA scouting services that are certified. Uh, we have college coaches that are, are on the live stream right now for Baller TV that we have partnered with. My name is Darius Kasula, and I'm from the Lafayette Tribe. It's been pretty tough, you know, my family was hit with it. Um, it really made our season short back home. But we pushed through and we got a state title and I'm proud of that. And we worked really hard, you know, with the masks on and everything. It really impacted how we play and how we breathe and stuff, but it really benefited us in the, in the same way. When it first hit, like, it dropped everything. Now, like, we had a basketball season, we're having seasons and stuff. But I just gotta keep working, working through all of it. And yeah. My name is Sam Morgan. My tribe is Navajo and Kiowa. It's been so hard. Uh, the first few months, I couldn't even get on a court because they were all closed. I just had to keep myself in shape by running and jump roping, and that's what really helped me. 
So because they didn't have a season, uh, a lot of them, a lot of them missed uh, tournaments where they could actually view in college coach in front of college coaches. They didn't have that. So we want to we want to get them to college more. We want to see more natives get into college. My dream one is Duke University, but if I get offered from anywhere, I'll go to it. Uh, I plan on going to college at Oregon University. Like to go to Boston University in Massachusetts. They are my top college, but I will be happy with anything in Texas X. I like staying close. Um, I hope I can get a few recruiters, you know, um, some people to start looking at me because I know what I can do and I have a lot of potential. And I'm glad I'm here so that I can showcase it. My duty to help these kids any way we can. Players report since then, several have already received calls from colleges. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thalhungva. And when we come back, could you use a little financial advice? Patty, when we come back, we'll talk with a financial consultant who will share some ideas about the money front. Having a budget may prove, have proved difficult during the pandemic. Joining us today to talk about money manners is Sean Spruce. He's a financial education consultant and has a podcast called Natives on a Budget. Welcome, Sean. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, I mean, right now with uh, the American Relief uh, Act and all of the measures the federal government has done for the pandemic, sometimes people are dealing with amounts of money they haven't in a long time. And thinking that through is really important. Maybe talk about what you would tell somebody. Yeah, it, it really has. And, and you know, uh, obviously a lot of people have really struggled during COVID. A lot of people have lost jobs. They've been laid off. A lot of businesses have, have shut down. And it, a lot of people have been hurt by this. But a lot of people also have found themselves with a few extra bucks in their pockets, right? You know, we're already into a third round of stimulus and uh, people are sitting at home. They haven't had a lot of money to spend. So they've got money in the bank and, you know, there's definitely a uh, silver lining to that. So I think the biggest challenge right now is just preparing for when these lockdowns just kind of fully unwind and we're pretty much back to normal. I think the mood is we're pretty much, you know, around the corner of the pandemic. I think we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And I feel like it's almost like a big rubber band. It's been stretched, 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 right? It's just stretched out and people have been waiting and they're not spending, they're not going to hotels, they're not going out to eat, they're not traveling. But when that green light comes on and we're finally able to just go out and start living again, I'm worried that a lot of people are going to run the risk of really overextending themselves because they just haven't had a chance to spend money so much. So right now, more than anything, you know, make a plan, you know, plan for those stimulus payments, uh, figure out how you want to spend them. If you want to put some into savings, if you want to pay off some debt, definitely if you want to have some fun time, plan for that, budget for that accordingly. I find that if people just take the time to make that plan, make a simple budget, kind of allocate how they want to spend the money. Uh, they just do so much better when it comes to actually managing and if people don't go in blindly and they don't really prepare for how to, how to budget, how to make a plan, you know, just five bucks here, 10 bucks here, 20 bucks there next to, you, you know, it's all gone, whether it's a thousand dollars or $10,000. How should, what are the basic steps for a family to prepare for a budget? Well, the first step is you want to track all your income coming in and whether that's from salaries, whether it's wages, whether that's maybe increased unemployment benefits, whether maybe you've got a small business, maybe you're self-employed. We see so many people in Indian country these days that are self-employed, gig economy kind of workers. So all those sources of income could be per capita, tribal dividends, whatever it is, add all those sources of income together. And usually on a monthly basis, some people like to do a shorter time frame, keeps them a little more focused, maybe uh, every other week or even weekly, but add all that income together, figure out how much you have coming in and then track how much you have going out. What are your monthly expenses and keep a good, good record of that. There's all kinds of cool apps you can use to track how much you're spending every month. A lot. If you're using your, your bank account, if you're using a debit card, uh, you've probably got a mobile banking app that you can access, tell you time to the penny, how much you're spending. If you spend with cash, write those figures down, hold on to receipts. 
and track how much is going out, how much you have coming in every month, how much you have going out, and then just calculate the difference. And if it's a positive number, that means you're spending less than you make. It means you're running a def, uh, excuse me, a surplus, and that's good. That's what we want. It means we're on top of things. And if that is a negative number, it means uh, you've got negative cash flow. It means you're running a deficit. You're spending more than you're bringing in. And that's not ideal. And you run into that situation, you've got two options. You can either increase how much money you have coming in, increase that income, or you can cut expenses. And I think in most cases with most people, it's easier and it's faster to trim expenses than it is to increase income. So that's what we want to avoid. We want to avoid that, that red number, that negative cash flow. We want to get that positive. And again, it starts with planning. Sean, you mentioned the gig economy, and, and that has so dramatically changed really everything in the last 10 years. And part of that is people have to plan or they get caught at the end of the year with taxes due and expenses that you just don't ex expect every day. It really is. And I think to be a gig economy worker requires a higher level of financial diligence because exactly, you know, if you have a job, if you're earning a paycheck, uh, you have income, you have taxes that are withheld. And so you're not worried about that big tax bill at the end of the year because you've had your withholding more than likely you're going to get a refund. When you're a gig economy worker, that's all on you. You've got to make those estimated quarterly tax payments, sometimes even monthly, depending on how much you're making as a gig economy worker. And that's up to you. And if you don't do that consistently at the end of the year, you're going to find yourself with a big tax bill. So again, the accounting, really keeping track, uh, record keeping, budgeting is so much more important when you're a gig economy worker on your own. You've just got so many other steps you got to take into account. And ultimately, it's all on you. You don't have an employer that's helping you with this. It's doing any withholding. So it, it is challenging. And, and even just keeping those records. So many times I meet people in Indian country, gig economy workers, artists, craftspeople, and uh, they're not reporting that income. And um, you know, ultimately that affects them. They're not able to make deductions for supplies and, and other types of costs that they have to their business. Um, ultimately, they're not paying tax on their income, which maybe that gives them a little bit more money in the short term. But in the long term, if they need to apply for a loan in the future uh, with this whole COVID issue, applying for benefits and things like that, if they don't have that track record, if they don't have documented self-employment income, they're not going to be uh, eligible for as many benefits. So really important to, uh, if you're a gig economy person, do it right. Do it legal, make it official, pay your taxes, do your reporting, uh, take care of all your all your financial documents. Well, and one part of that that um, is not generally talked about is uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives have the lowest percentage of Social Security eligibility. And part of it's from either the gig economy or treaty fishing or things like that that don't show up on SSI deductions. And if you don't have those, you're not going to get to retire the same way other people are. Right. It's a good point. Yeah. And then, you know, years ago, and I, now it's been, you know, it's been a few years, but if you go back to, you know, the 1970s, 1960s, you, know, you had federal service employees, uh, they had their own federal service uh, retirement plan. So they weren't, they didn't even take social security out for those people in those days either, you know? So again, most of those folks have retired on, but it's, it's always been different in Indian country, right. With regard to social security yeah. and some of these, different um, safety net programs that I think uh, other people kind of take for granted and just assume they work a certain way. And in country, it's always worked a little bit differently. And you mentioned how the pandemic has um, actually improved finances for some people. If you work in an office and you can transfer to Zoom, uh, your life was not disrupted the same way as somebody who had to be out in a place where you met people, so you probably got laid off. Uh, some people have gotten actually higher unemployment benefits than they did before uh, the pandemic. How do you make sure to take advantage or uh, to get out of a hole if you're in one? So two, two questions there. Well, yeah, you definitely need to, to pay attention to all the different stimulus and uh, all the other types of benefits that are available. And of course, you know, we keep hearing about the federal benefits, right? These big stimulus payments that are going out, the direct payments uh, that are coming through from the federal government, but there are also state benefits available and then many tribal benefits as well. And many, many tribes have been able to offer direct payments. They're offering um, assistance for buying food and groceries. They're offering assistance for housing costs as well. So I think it's really important to do your homework and, and look at what's available. And I'm also going to say, don't be too proud. Don't be too proud. I mean, I applied for a, I got a PPP loan, you know, uh, paycheck protection program loan uh, because I'm self-employed because as a consultant, I've got this, this self-employment income. 
And, um, you know, they, they put that, it's all public information. It goes out. Anybody can Google it. Sean Spruce, PPP loan, how much I got, you know, but Hey, you know, this is, this is unprecedented. These are unprecedented times. And uh, if the money's available, if you don't take advantage of it, somebody else will. Well, we know from history that when we come out of a pandemic, and I think your rubber band was a great example of that, is that things are going to be popping for a while. And um, both as an individual or an entrepreneur, how do you set up for that? How do you make sure you maximize um, what's about to happen, I guess? Well, I think you need to prepare for it and just understand that, okay, you know, obviously things are changing now and we're going to be able to move around more. We're going to be able to have more opportunities to spend money, but just really understand that, you know, be, be prepared for that. It's like, you know, if you've been on a diet for a long time and suddenly you're treated to this big, fancy, lavish meal, pace yourself, some self-control. And again, I really do think it comes back to, to taking the time to come up with a written plan, a budget of some sort. So you've got that framework to work from. You've got to have, can't go in it blindly. You've got to have, again, earmark. Okay. If I, you know, if I've got this money and now I'm going to be able to travel again, we're going to go on vacation this year. We're going to be spending more time out doing things. Earmark how much you can afford to spend on those different types of expenses, whether it's flexible expenses you can control or luxury expenses for just fun time. Uh, really, really take the time. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the 50, 30, 20 rule. 50% uh, of your money goes to fixed expenses, costs that don't change from month to month. That could be a car payment, insurance, rent, or a mortgage. 30% of those flexible expenses, these are costs we can control, right? So like think of gasoline, think of utilities, think of the grocery bill. And then you've got 20% that you can put in savings. And this is just a framework. It's just a guide. It's not, you know, the end all be all. Some people might not be able to afford 20% in savings, but it's a really good uh, template to use to just kind of get all your ducks in a row. It's not too complicated, easy to follow. That's one thing, managing money, budgeting, it doesn't have to be complicated. There's a lot of cool tools out there. You can get apps on a phone. Uh, you can use just handwritten budgets work great too. Don't make it too complicated. Don't make it too confusing. And again, it all comes down to just figuring out how much you have coming in, how much you have going out. And if there's a, if there's a de deficit there, if there's a, a, sh a shortage, get that right side up. Increase that income or decrease those expenses, whatever you can do. We only have about a minute left. Uh, tell folks where they can find your work and, and learn more about finances. Yeah, so I, I do a lot of work with a nonprofit called First Nations Development Institute, and uh, they're available online. They got a lot of great resources. I write a monthly column called Ask Dr. Percap that's available in a lot of tribal newspapers, newsletters. Uh, I've got funding from the Finner Investor Education Foundation to do that work. And I also have a podcast called Natives on a Budget along with a website. So check that out online as well. And, and last question, do you think... Uh Folks should have an investment strategy, should be more than just savings, but actually thinking about long-term investment. That's not something we grow up with. <laughs> no, you know, I think there's this misconception that, oh, you know, I, I, I need a lot of money to invest, right? And, and you can get started investing with just a few hundred dollars. I think it's important to really, there's a few things you want to take care of first. You want to take care of any kind of consumer debt you have. If you've got credit card debt, uh, if you've got a car loan, try and pay that kind of stuff off. But right away, yeah, start building a nest egg for the future. You know, savings is more short term, right? That's, you know, maybe a year out. But if you think long term, three, four, five, 10 years, you want to invest for that. And it's never too early. In fact, the sooner you start investing, the better. It's easier now than ever to invest. There's so much information available and you can get started investing with a relatively small amount of money. On that note, thank you, Sean. Thank you. When we come back, another tribe and another fight against mining. We'll tell you about the latest from the Fond du Lac Band. Joining us today is Marionette Pember. She has two stories out right now. Native children discriminate by school, parents say, and Fond du Lac Band wins Halt to Copper Mine. Welcome, Marionette. Hi, Mark. Good to be here. Let's talk about copper mines. <laughs> What's the latest on that? 
Yeah, well, uh, the Fond du Lac Band had determined, like a number of other tribes had determined their own water quality standards, but there seems like they are the first tribe who's actually able to use what they call uh, their rights as a downstream state to uh, require the Army Corps of Engineers to revisit a water permit that they had granted to the polymet mine. So it's a real, that's a really big deal. I mean, they have, they could still, you know, um, the Army Corps of Engineers could, could still, you know, approve the permit. But um, in the past, you know, the uh, tribe has been litigating against this for years. And uh, basically the administration just ignored them. Um, so this is a, like a really big deal. It's a really big score for tribes, for tribal sovereignty. Well, and I should point out that the new Deputy Assistant Secretary for Civil Works at the uh, Army Corps of Engineers is Jamie Pinkham, who uh, not only has experience in this area, but lived in Minnesota working for the Bush Foundation. So he probably knows this issue pretty well. Yes, and there's been a lot of changes, you know, in the administration. Um, the EPA, uh, newly appointed uh, Reagan is his name, um, who actually is like, uh, he's just cleaning house. I mean, he fired like 40 uh, uh, science advisors and he also activated the climate change page that had been shut down during the tr uh, Trump administration. So, um, you know, we could see some big changes. Well, and one of the things the Biden administration has made it clear is that they want climate to be a metric. And if you just start measuring that, it changes your outcome on a lot of these close calls. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, um, particularly regarding, you know, these, these uh, extractive industries such as mining, you know, that has a, they have a long history in uh, Minnesota and these copper mines have been really looking to get a foothold there. Um, and it's, you know, they release a great deal of mercury. Um, it can be really dangerous, particularly in like a fragile environment, such as the boundary waters uh, up there in Minnesota. So, and it also has, I think the uh, impact is like just, I think is uh, forever. So it isn't like some other things that actually have some sort of a determinate half-life. So, I mean, this could have a great deal of import, not only for native folks, but for everybody that lives there. And I think that this underscores the, uh, the power um, that uh, tribal sovereignty can exert on issues like this. I, I wonder, and I know you've reported on this before about how this fits in with the economics of the region where some communities are clamoring for this kind of development. And yet many tribes and other communities are saying, well, let's slow down and take a harder look at it. How does that play in? Well, you know, what's interesting is uh, Minnesota has, well, and actually Northern Wisconsin as well and, and Michigan, they have a very long uh, history of mining. People came, you know, people immigrated here to mine, to work in these mines. Um, and, you know, just that whole history of extraction um, is uh, it, you know has a long a long history in that part of the country and actually um, Minnesota still operates I think they operate like seven taconite mines which is a form of um, uh, iron ore mining but it's like they they were able to come up with the technology um, you know something like about 15 or 20 years ago where they could mine iron ore that was considered you know was not uh, marketable wasn't feasible to mine and it's like really dirty they dig this giant hole in the ground and they have to like grind it up and then ship it to other places and it you know has an impact on the air quality and and on the water as well um, I don't know if you may recall uh, in like uh, 2014 um, in uh, northern Wisconsin in the Pinocchio Mountains, um, there was the Gogemic Taconite Mining Company that had uh, their eyes set on a site that uh, was over the Bad River watershed, which uh, would have you know drained into Lake Superior. But they actually, Wisconsin was able to defeat that. So you know they have that long history there in Minnesota. Um, you know it's a lot of. Um, union folks that work in those mines and traditionally those folks voted democratic but as people began having growing concerns about the uh, impact on the environment of these industries you know they sort of um, put their um, support behind um, republicans like donald trump so it's just very you know we're looking at this sort of uh, i would say these sort of dueling views of capitalism short term and long term in the short term view you know these are quote unquote good um, you know, good for the economy. In the long-term view, they're really bad for the environment. And, you know, uh, traditionally indigenous people, you know, do take a much longer view uh, of any kind of thing that we do that impacts our, our climate and our, our, our planet. 
D does the idea of going back and revisiting uh, regulations that are already in effect give hope to folks who are fighting, say, pipelines in the region? I think so. And well, you know, a lot of these regulations were uh, weakened under the Trump administration, particularly water. Um, it, and it was, it has been very, very political. The um, woman who was appointed, uh, actually a region five director of the EPA, uh, is a former Republican Senator, Kathy Stepp for Wisconsin, and, uh, was also appointed at the head of natural resources in Wisconsin by Scott Walker. So, and as you might recall, basically Wisconsin kind of like the, let the mining industry re rewrite their mining regulations. So she was considered quite friendly to um, extractive industry. And uh, while she was uh, involved in, while she was serving uh, uh, in region five for the EPA, uh, when they actually were accepted recommendations from the, you know, the study for the EPA, she insisted that they read the uh, study over the phone rather than have it submitted in print and then it would have gone into public records. So that was like quite the scandal. Marinette Pember, what else are you working on? We only have about a minute left. Okay, well, also uh, uh, discrimination in schools in uh, Ashland, Wisconsin, uh, a family who uh, are saying that uh, the school district discriminated against their children in terms of the application of uh, COVID uh, restrictions. Very well, thank you, Marinette. Thanks for having me, Mark. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. We will be back with another edition tomorrow. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand Indian Country Today is produced at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. This is Indian Country Today.